Hello everybody on YouTube, welcome to our next live autism speech, number six at the beautiful Camden. It's a beautiful place. And Sam the second from the book is here, of course. It's an honor. I will talk to you soon. Here we go. Um, so I just wanted to formally introduce Gabriel to everybody um, and give a bit of a rundown of what it's all about. So um, Gabriel has an advanced diploma in financial services, a diploma in sports science, a bachelor of science majoring in applied mathematics, graduating from distinction. He recently completed an honours thesis researching quantum dark matter, if you know what that is, through Charles Sturt University. Um, and already this month he has given a physics talk of quantum dark matter at the AZ AFP conference in 2019 at Australian New Zealand Institute of Mathematical Physics. Am I speaking loud enough? Yes, you yeah. yeah. Um, Gabriel speaks, and well, correct me if there's any more, he speaks French, Italian, Arabic, Syriac, Aramaic. Is that it, Gabriel? Oh, and Bradley. <laughs> 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 and German, Italian, and German? No. Yeah. Nine. No, not German. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of everything. He also teaches languages online. He teaches Syriac, Aramaic scripts online via the Gospel of Matthew, which was written in that language. He has several online channels currently where he talks about autism, physics, and many other topics. He scored a perfect score at the Conservatory of Music in preliminary classical piano at age of 10, where he played four classical pieces by memory. He recently taught himself the guitar in 600 minutes on YouTube. He was an accomplished DJ with hundreds of, hundreds of um, mixed CD sales and club performances in the early 2000s. He has DJed on radio. One of his tracks was played at the NRL before 40,000 people and on Channel 9 during the NRL half time. We can have that in our list from Gabriel. His track. Gabriel has been a talented student pilot. He has run a financial services business for several years and at the same time successfully ran a sports car hire business and a sports motorbike hire business. He has also um, had articles written in three newspapers and done radio interviews on ABC, Radio in Scotland, and also Boston, USA. Recently, uh, Gabriel rode his five-wheel tricycle slash sled, which I call a recumbent bike. Is that correct? I call it the Jeff Mobile. The Jeff uh, her brother's Jeff who helped me build it. Recumbent yeah. bike, whatever you want to call it. He rode it from Sydney to Goldwood, and he raised over two and a half thousand dollars to donate hundreds of copies of his book to regional New South Wales libraries and to families with 46 children. Um, Gabriel was a volunteer teacher of English to people who had recently migrated to Australia at Guildford Library Commission Australia for over a year. He also has a puppet family, which he use, often uses to get messages across. His most developed character being called Pompous. <laughs> and of course, he's written an incredible book on living with autism, which has sold over a thousand copies to date. There have been interested parties who would like to make a movie from the school as well. Gabriel also drives buses and big doubles in the state in his spare time, and he is an extremely unique individual. But most importantly, he is the nicest and most genuine person that I know, and he has been an absolute pleasure. It has been an absolute pleasure having him in my life. So, you know a little bit about Gabriel? Thank you. Gabriel. Gabriel. Thank you very much for the compliments, Wendy, and I'm sorry to your husband, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> all right, so uh, welcome everybody, it's lovely to see you all, thank you for having me. And the first page I have to show you on the little printout that I have is the little recumbent sled here, called the, it's either called the Savant Mobile or the Jeff Mobile, I'm not sure, we'll figure it out. But in 2009 or 10, I think it was April 2010, I lost my license. Uh, and I uh, won't explain why yet, uh, but uh, um, I decided I needed to tr transport myself to work, so I thought I'll get a recumbent tricycle, and I noticed it was too slow, so I was uh, able to, with the help of Jeff, um, add to it a one engine initially, and that still had it classified as a bicycle, but I was able to get to work in 20 minutes instead of in a car which took 17. So it was good. Um, I stopped using it after six months because I actually lost too much weight uh, riding it, but I thought I would ride it from Sydney to Goulburn. I wanted to make it to Canberra. The sign still says Sydney to Canberra on the sled, so we should get there one day. Uh, 
But uh, by the way, this is on YouTube as we, it's not, it will go on YouTube and it's live on, uh, on Periscope. So there are guests here from America listening to uh, 21 people so far. All right. And I thought, why not try and raise money for autism? So I took that sled and wrote it with a lot of breakdowns along the way, which were hilarious on YouTube. You can see them if you ever down and need to laugh at me, which is good. And we were raised two and a half thousand dollars, and I sent the books all around to regional libraries in Vigo. They said, why don't you come down to us and see us? Initially, I was only sending it to libraries in Sydney, and I said, I'm, I'm happy to speak, but I accidentally, well, my assistant accidentally sent it to Vigo, because, you know, why not? And, uh, and they said, yes, please come down. I'm like, oh, yes, I will drive six hours, gladly. So I went down there, gave them a speech, and then I thought, okay, let's give them to other regional libraries, because I just discovered that there were so many people that knew nothing about autism outside of Sydney. That's about it. So why am I even here? Well, um, I had, I guess if you read the book, it's relatively disastrous, unless you compare it to someone living in abject hockey in the third world. But apart from that, it was pretty uh, traumatic, but I ended up being convinced that uh, it was myself who had the problem, it was obviously uh, myself. But uh, there were a few good people I met in my life which gave me the confidence to do certain things. And that was post the suicidal age 25 in 2006. Uh, my, without, I'm sorry to those who've heard it already, but my father found my body before I uh, bled out and was, I was in a coma for two and a half days. And once I recovered, I uh, decided to try to get therapy and understand what was going on uh, with uh, why I was continuously falling into so many problems. Um, anyway, uh, that didn't change too much. I still had some huge problems that happened in 2014. And so I went to someone even more qualified and they found that I had something that was, there's only so far only 100 people in the world um, have this uh, condition which is high functioning autism and savantism together. I'm sure there's more, but there's probably not many survey groups in some continents. So we're lucky here that we can have that. Uh, and of course I didn't believe it. They gave me a, a series of tests and uh, with savantism what happens is that there is a part of your brain which can outperform, it seems to be able to perform superhuman tasks. So being able to read a language in 20 hours and then speak the language, for example, um, or fly a plane in five hours, uh, you taxi to the runway and you first go perfectly, um, you know, uh, be able to do a maths degree with a distinction without going to the lectures in two years. Um, and uh, stuff, being able to hear something and then memorize it, these type of things. But it comes at a cost. And that cost is that other parts of the brain don't function as well. Um, it's obvious when you look at someone who's a, who has savantism who actually has an average IQ that's below average, because the part of their brain that can do amazing things like remember dates or know that the multiples of seven in February land on a Thursday, and, and uh, as well as March of this year. Uh, so for example, my birthday, because it's on the 13th, is tomorrow instead of a Thursday. So, so little things like that, those people that have those abilities uh, they normally have, um, say, uh, inadequate uh, or neurodivergent function in the negative direction with other parts of their uh, brain power. So they might not be able to walk correctly or, uh, or obviously can't speak correctly. Uh, but in my, un unfortunately in my case, uh, my, the part of my brain that's not functioning very well is functioning at the average level. And that's the visual section, the ability to recognize faces, uh, recognize their drawings, etc. Uh, the other part of the brain has an IQ of over 200, so it's, it can't really be measured. It's have done too many tests, and there's, there's actually not enough uh, human beings that form part of the IQ test to, uh, to see what the exact number is. It's within something called a statistical margin of error. Uh, and of course, I thought that was a load of crap when I first was told that in 2014. So I have since then been part of a lot of studies and trying to prove them wrong. So that's, I started, I did the maths degree to prove them wrong, the joke's on me. I learned Aramaic in 15 minutes, uh, or the script in 15 minutes, um, and st stuff like that that I just uh, didn't think was unusual at the time. Now I've come to learn that it is. And only yesterday, 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 I've been, I was invited by the University of New South Wales and the University of Queensland to be a paid contributor to their postdoctorate uh, researchers uh, from here on in. So uh, you'll see my, my name in more publications. I asked them to squeeze in a thumbs up as my picture, but we'll see how we go. So that's why we were here. And 
the, the book was, it's called The Tragedy for a Reason. Uh, if you look back at it, it's almost unbelievable for those who have read it and, and told me so, for those who can understand my, my writing. Uh, and I thought I may as well try and discuss autism as much as I can. So I'll be doing that online for a long period of time. And I've had interviews with the, one of the most prominent uh, autism speakers for females with autism, uh, who's, who's now a, I guess you call them an acquaintance, and uh, just constantly giving advice at UNSW. I've been in a few publications already, which is great, and uh, giving more and more speeches, talking online to, I think I've had 4.7 million likes on Periscope, and there's a few thousand people watching a week, which is good, and a lot of people who didn't know that they might be on the spectrum or have someone on the spectrum. Um, they're benefiting from hearing these, and hopefully, hopefully people don't make the same mistakes that my naive brain did, which got me into lots of uh, trouble. And that's the plan. If I can do that, hopefully I can be a blind person, not leading another blind person off the cliff. That's the plan. So, uh, just a, do any, does anyone have any questions at the moment? I will take that as a no. Okay, so uh, I started playing piano at about a year and a half. Uh, and by the time I was three, um, I have read, and, and forgive me if you've also done this, I don't know, but uh, this seems normal to me. I'm just discovering that it's not. I read two novels by the age of three, by the age of five. I'd already um, uh, gone to school and had read um, half of the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Um, out of the seven books, half is obviously 3.5, so let's just say three to be conservative. And uh, I was already not fitting in. I specifically have very clear memories of being age of two and three and not fitting in very well at all at, uh, at preschool. In fact, I didn't realize that you had to make eye contact until 20 uh, when I went out on this, on this date with a girl, went out on this girl with a date, um, whichever one. <laughs> and, and she explained to me why uh, she wasn't going to have a further date, so I had learned at that point to, uh, to actually start making eye contact. And since that point, I have been learning how to, uh, I say, invisibilize the neurodivergent behavior as much as I can. So how to walk, how to speak, how to dress, how to, uh, the timing of speech, how to make eye contact, recognizing facial expressions. Uh, and that's what's been happening ever since. Now the consequence is, of course, that you start to appear more and more normal. And the more normal, quote unquote, you appear, the more punished uh, you get, or the, 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 the exacerbation of the punishment uh, is realized um, when you commit acts that, out of naivety when people think you should know better. Okay, that's, that's one of the biggest problems with autism. Uh, you, that you might get mistaken for being a narcissist or being a smart ARSE, AWS for those in the US. Um, and, and in fact, you didn't actually mean to. Uh, in probably 95% of the cases, uh, it becomes quite hilarious. I can already, looking around, I get the impression I can tell already who's had similar experiences. That's my uh, impression. So uh, by the age of five, uh, the, the bullying probably got pretty pretty bad uh, at that age, uh, but there were some people that were okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was growing up between five and ten uh, was was quite disastrous. But you can have a look at that in the book, and it got worse at about puberty. So, in hindsight, retroactively, the the depression, I guess if you could call it depression, I don't think I was aware of it, but it, it definitely was saddened severely by being ostracized at age three by the other students at the play group. And they would do what I thought was weird, like play duck, duck, goose, and I didn't want to be touched. Um, and I've now discovered that there's an oversensitivity to stimuli, which many people probably know now with autism I wasn't aware of in the past. And they would, from my perspective, the kids would talk nonsensical gibberish to each other and do that in the play groups and play yards, and it wouldn't make any logical Set. So that was where the divergence uh, in social understanding commenced. And it increasingly got worse. By the age of 12, I wrote my first suicide note, but that was the connection between escaping and life. So I wanted to escape from a very young age because many things that might come to your mind when you first hear about autism or whatever you did, why didn't you try this, why didn't you try that? Couldn't you do this? Maybe that could be better. And all of those things are something that someone with autism, I guess in my case, was going through from a young age. And so by the time you reach 12, you already have nine years of experience of being feeling dejected and being rejected and ostracized and considered a pariah, etc. And so at the age of 12, it's, you're, you've already been living in nine years of abject misery, and so you want to leave. Uh, and that's where the thoughts of suicide commenced. It coincided with a new school 
and slowly went downhill uh, until the third and proper attempt at age uh, 25. And uh, after that, I decided to live to help other people because that sort of what gave me value because the value or self-value was actually robbed. And that's, this is not a blame game because I don't actually blame anyone and nobody went out there and understood what was going on to decide to do whatever they did. But growing up like that and constantly being ostracized wherever you go, you develop a subconscious identity uh, of minimal value of yourself. And so you're convinced it's, it's just the fact that you're an idiot or there's something wrong with you or you're a disease or something like that. And so from the age of 25 to say 33, 34, I was constantly trying to, once I discovered that I had this intellect, um, to try and compensate and show the world you know, how, how much I could be of help and use to the world. Um, but that's also an overcorrection. So that's typical with autism where you can sort of go one way and then you go to the extreme um, other side and not understanding that there is a nuance and a balance. Um, I've learned to compensate by understanding something called variables. So the gray is what someone with autism doesn't really see. But what I do is I create lots of variables in a, in a long maths equation and say some are switched on, some are switched off, and you, you sort of try to balance all of them. I'm speaking very abstractly because uh, I'm not sure how many people have read the book or what you want to know in particular. There's so many things to talk about with autism. Um, I, I've, a lot of my research recently has been uh, with females with autism because I, it's quite obvious I inherited it from my mother, we inherited it from her father. And uh, it does definitely manifest differently, I'm, I think, in females. Um, obviously, that's a sample of one. But I would say that one of the issues with measuring autism is that it's being measured against an, a yardstick independent of gender or independent of biological sex. And I would say it would probably be an idea to see how much the child deviates from their specific uh, uh, biological sex. So with a, with a female, possibly, it might be that they exhibit traits that we've in the past attributed to, you know, classical male behavior, for example. Um, but at the same time, they're not as socially awkward as a male might be, but compared to other females, they are socially more awkward via the same distance. And that would definitely cause a lot of problems um, for a female in that group. And I can see it in my younger cousin now who failed to meet the diagnosis criteria for, for independent or objective autism. But it's quite clear, I, have this, I think I have this sense when I talk to someone, the way that they respond. If they respond in the way that seems intuitive to me, then I'm thinking they must have autism. Because <laughs> hold on a second, you're not supposed to feel normal to me. Um, so. Uh, that's that's probably one of the things I want to say about uh, female autism, um, as far as I can see. Um, I've lost my words actually. I don't even know what else to say. <laughs> but uh, does anyone have any other questions? Does anyone? Did anyone? Why did someone come here? Why did, uh, did they want to know more about autism or figure out that there's someone in their family who has it? Or, uh, yeah. Awesome. Yes. What support do you get from your from your family? When you were growing up, uh, that's you that's yes. yes. Or yes. Uh, yes. So um, my first excuse was that it was the eighties. Because <laughs> no, but in the in the there was a at at preschool there was a behavioural psychologist who explained that I was having some sort of social difficulties, but they weren't aware at the time what autism was, especially in, West, in the western suburbs of Sydney. Um, my father is someone who's all heart and was an immigrant, uh, a recent immigrant to Australia at that time. So I don't think it was something he was able to see. Uh, my mother was becoming a very successful business person. So it was not something that she was able to um, witness at the time. Um, she suffered immense guilt from that because in hindsight, uh, she can now see the whole pattern. But at the time it was more maybe he's just gifted or maybe he's just a little bit quirky but he'll grow out of it. Uh, that type of thing. But what I think happened was that the because of my autism and high functioning, with my my physical behaviour might not have deviated too much, but it, I think it, the gap between my behaviour and others increasingly grew over time. Because if you're not with other people, then you don't know how to correct your behaviour to make it more neurotypical, I guess. 
And then the less you're with them, the further you deviate. And the further you deviate, the less you're with people. And so by the time I reached 12 to 15, there was such a huge divergence. And by then, I think my parents might have just been used to me being weird or quirky or something like that, I guess, in hindsight. Yeah, quirky. Yeah, yeah, quirky. What I, I just call myself normal and everyone else is quirky, something like that. Yeah, that's about it. Um, I use earplugs to walk in public for the, for the most um, part of the day. And uh, I also like libraries a lot, so I'm glad that we're here. And my goal is really just to answer more questions about people with autism if they don't know uh, how their child's handling it. Um, that's really about it. I, is, is there anything you wanted me to discuss? In um, I want to know when you were diagnosed with Tourette's. Ah, I was diagnosed with Tourette's in 2006. Yeah. Okay. I was 25. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So the, the syllable started at age 10 in 1991 when I was learning our syllables at school. That's when it became less controlled. Before that, I used to have other tics, so eye blinking and nose snorting, I guess, or air snorting. Uh, but growing up in a sort of a strict immigrant family, there was a lot of community who would say, that's not right, don't do that, don't act in that type of way. So I learned to suppress it, but I think in hindsight, by suppressing those tics, it came out in a verbal form. Uh, and that got me into detention because the, the teachers actually thought I was doing it deliberately when it was an itch that just had to be scratched. I've learned to mitigate that now with daily medication. Uh, so one of, the, one of the medications that I take is a, it's an SSRI or a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is a form of antidepressant, but it also has a calming effect on, on Tourette's. Uh, and I also exercise daily. And I designed a little, as I was telling my friend here, I designed a little desk with a exercise bike underneath so I can pedal as I'm working on my mathematics or you know, giving out uh, Periscope videos or YouTube videos. And that actually helps lower the amount of um, Tourette's attacks and it's almost controllable. So if, if there's a mental stress that pops up and I can tell it's coming, sort of like the bathroom, I guess, you, you, you get prepared <laughs> and, you, and you leave. Um, or you drive on your Vespa on the freeway and say hello to the wind. <laughs> Can't answer back. <laughs> yes. So on top of that, I I didn't know that I had these abilities, and at school I was quite heavily misunderstood. Uh, there were things like, you know, once I, as a kid I read a book in a few hours, came back to school the next day, and um, was frustrated that the other kids had only read the first two pages and couldn't understand why. So that was one of the biggest problems. You don't understand why other people act in a certain way. You can fall into the the problem of thinking that they're stupid. So I have, a, I have an uncle who's a physics professor who's my mother's brother, and it's quite obvious if you meet him that he's on the spectrum. And uh, he just, uh, I guess, in general, probably grew up thinking everyone else was dumb, but was unable to see his own deficiencies. And that's one of the, one of the issues with, with, I think with humans in general, we don't tend to see our own flaws very well, but if you're someone who is neurodivergent, you're gonna get criticized more often, so you're sort of forced to either reject society or think that perhaps you do have some deficiencies uh, in some respects, not as in you as a personal moral value, but in terms of how your mind works, you might have some abilities here and here you might perform it you know, less than average compared to everyone else. And so it's important to recognize that you're not as perfect as you might think you are if you're a high function autistic person. Yeah, that's... So when you been diagnosed When? Uh, it was January, second week of January 2014. So, so age wise, you're still in the I was 32 and 11 months, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, so they, they, they started to get other students in, uh, and they asked me to close my eyes and tell them everything that was in the room. And I started doing that, and then they asked me for phone numbers, so I recited all the phone numbers I had since I was a kid, and the phone numbers of past ex girlfriends. <laughs> from 10, 15 years back, uh, and the lawyers and all that stuff. And, and I just thought, why are you asking me to do stupid tasks? You know, what? Obviously, anyone can do that. So that's another problem, is that someone with autism doesn't know what they do that is different, I guess, to the majority of, of the population. Uh, yeah. I think it's good to see most people grow up thinking they're normal. Yes. Even though they may not necessarily be normal, according to how society might find that. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's interesting to Yes, absolutely. 
sound, sound like you, you, you could share some of your journey one day. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, in your 50s. In the future, you mean. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, very cool. So just moving on to a few other uh, of the points in here. So numbers are a story for me. So what I noticed, for example, is that I had a natural affiliation with the computer programming. It seemed as though computers spoke what I call uh, more clearly to me than humans. And, and that was a great thing to do. Um, in the book, I describe in more detail. I don't want to bore you with too much. So there's so much to talk about that I'm not really sure what to say. But uh, some of the ways that I've learned to deal with it uh, one, by writing a book. Two, by talking each day. Uh, three, about giving uh, personal experiences on how I think versus how other people normally think and how other people also give me feedback on how things that I might do are a little bit different to, to most people, etc. And uh, it's basically just building a dialogue so that we can understand not only, not only that people with autism can understand regular society, I guess, or your typical constructed society, but we can also understand them, so there's a mutual integration, uh, as opposed to thinking, you know, I look, I, I, I've got the funniest story, uh, this person wrote this long email once to, to someone I know with autism, and um, the, the person with autism had sent them an email a week before to everybody, saying, I've now changed my email address. And they sent them a very long email explaining all these beautiful things and things that they've done, and then the person with autism replied and said, my new email address is this. And that was the end of the email. <laughs> so, you know, if you didn't, if people weren't aware, they might think, uh, oh, wow, that person's rude. When in fact, the person's being factual about a specific thing, which was, you've sent this email to my old address, here's my new one. And there's no emotion added to it at all. Uh, but that's a very, very basic example of how, if you don't know about autism and how it can manifest, you'll think that person's rude or that person's smart, I think, etc. Uh, there's a big problem. I, I personally think I, there's a lady in. A doctor at South Australian University, I think her name's Karen Armstrong, but I've been doing a lot of research into autism and crime, of course, and how you can unintentionally um, be involved in things that you didn't even know about. So one person with autism, for example, was a case study 10 years ago of someone who was desperate to make friends, and they asked him to drive them to the bank and just wait for them for 15 minutes um, while they went into the bank. Now, if any of you laughed, you know exactly what's going on there. Now, some with autism won't see that happening. And I think this is awesome, I have friends now. And I, I looked at that case and I thought, that could have been me so easily. I was so desperate for friends that, that it could have absolutely been that way. I, I, another big problem is autism and boundaries. And this is something I suffered with pretty badly uh, in the last few years. If you don't understand a boundary, even if you're in a, a position of power, um, if you feel that you need to help people, you are not aware of your limitations. So you can transgress or transcend a boundary and that can actually make other human beings become suspicious of you. So let's say that you're a psychiatrist with autism and you feel that this person needs help. And this actually happened actually. There was, a, there was a lady who cared about children and she was someone who was possibly on the, on the spectrum and decided to walk the child home because the child's parents hadn't shown up. So she walked with the child to go home. But because she had crossed the boundary of helping the child personally and helping into the house, then unfortunately she wasn't able to keep her job in the childcare practice because she broke the rules of the practice. But in her mind, she didn't even know that that, that rule existed. Because it's her mind, I need to help the kid. That's it. I help the kid until I stop helping the kid. Uh, until the kid no longer needs help. And the, the boundaries are actually invisible. Um, it's it happened a lot at school, like you know, walking into a class and talking at loud volume constantly. Because there's no warning sign in the brain to walk in and drop your voice. So if the teacher says, put your voice down, you don't know what that means. And I remember the first time Mr. Humphreys told me that in 1991, what I did was, I didn't understand what he meant. So I actually put my head down and tried to put my voice somewhere on the ground. Like, I couldn't actually understand what he was saying. Um, you know, things like that. And then there was a teacher who's, who said there's no such word as prequel. And then I kept telling him in front of the class that there was. Uh, that there was such a word as prequel, and it's just a prefix pre, which I said to him at the time, I think I think that has a Latin root etymologically. Um, and yeah, and then I came back the next week and said to him, look, here is a book, and it says prequel on the front, prequel is a word. So yeah, things like that, and obviously, you know, it's hilarious in hindsight. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious in hindsight. So autism in hindsight is quite funny if you survive the incident. Uh, 
but these are the type of things that it's important for people to look out for. <laughs> Yeah, that's about it. So thank you so much for allowing me to stumble across that train route while I hold you hostage. So now it's your turn to hold me uh, hostage with any questions that you may have. What are your travel photos here? Oh yes, uh, those are the those are the continuation of the Alps into the northern Lebanese mountains, and that's where my family comes from. And that was the first place I had experienced. Um, social gatherings where I was accepted as a person and I think because it's much more of a communitarian based society they accepted me just by the virtue of me being their blood relatives and to have people speak to me directly was something I could never forget and so forever that place is my, my home uh, and it was interesting I was there during the civil war at one point and uh, when I was six and civil wars are interesting because they happen in one location uh, that don't sort of happen everywhere, like like in the movies. So the majority of the mountains was quite beautiful, but there was an inter-Christian scuffle um, halfway through the war, and uh, there was, it was quite fascinating. I watched the guy get shot in the neck, and my father ran out unarmed with his father at the time, and grabbed the guy, and his sort of the head was dangling, and the blood was seeping onto the ground. Uh, yeah, so it's an interesting mix there. Oh, look, another, another example is when I was arrested as a Jewish spy. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that innocuous uh, memory there. Yeah. Uh, so there was a wall uh, between, build the wall uh, between Lebanon and Syria, and there was a river called the Great River, or the Big River, in Arabic they're both the same word. So I was looking to see how big it was, and I couldn't see it because the wall was in the way, but there was a ladder, and I thought, okay, there's a ladder, so obviously they want you to climb the wall. So I climbed the wall, and uh, immediately there was a guy that came and grabbed me and put a gun to me, and asked, why are you here? And I said, I wanted to see how big the river was. Now, of course, he didn't believe me, I couldn't understand why. Yeah, so, because I'm alive, I'll tell you that story, it's hilarious. Yeah, little things like that. So, thanks. Yeah, any other questions? How did you get out of that? Oh, I was there for 45 minutes with him, and I realized I was going to get out of it when another soldier came with a semi automatic rifle, and he said to me, Don't say anything, I'll say to him, You're my friend. So, I thought I made a friend. But when, I, when, when he let me go, he actually took the contents of my wallet. So I thought, friends are expensive. Yeah. yeah, that's how I got out of it. And when I got back over the wall, that taxi driver picked me up, and he could tell from my accent that I had a Christian heritage in Lebanon. And he said, apparently I was Herbie Christie, that I've heard of, who made it over the wall back to, uh, back to Lebanon. So there you go. But the river wasn't that great. It was, it was basically a creek. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You were saying part of the reason why you're doing all these talks is to get people to understand people with autism. Yeah. Are you finding you're having many results with people that are autistic understanding uh, a neurotypical way of life? Good question. Um, I find that the majority of people with autism who can function and are my age or younger, so far, um, are too upset with the fact that they're not understood and so are only focused on themselves being understood. Which, which is, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I have had a small success, but it's taken a lot of effort. Yeah. So, like explaining, oh, so to, and I'll answer you, sorry. Uh, there was one guy, for example, thank you for the question, you made my speech look good. So, uh, there was one guy that was 25 and like a typical medium to high functioning autistic, he had the emotional mind of an 11 year old or 12 year old, which I had not long ago and I had to learn with intense therapy and because of my support mind, I've been able to, 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 to grow up emotionally very quickly in comparison. It's, it's learning a language basically. And when this guy would leave home he, every day, he would never call his mum and he would think that why does she keep telling me to call her? Because I just saw her in the morning and I'm going to be back home at night. Which is exactly what you would say, logical. I explained to him that as someone, who, a neurotypical, they need to be reminded emotionally that you care about them because you are openly contacting them even though you don't have to. And that's the part that shows them that you want to be in touch with them voluntarily, which makes them feel like they have value in life from you that they're not getting only because they gave birth to you. So I had to explain it logically to him, and then as soon as I did that, 
it actually allowed him to understand what we would regularly call empathy. And from that day on, whenever he's left the house, he's poor. Which means that that's different to a narcissist, where the narcissist doesn't physically have empathy. The autist person does have empathy, but it's locked up in another language. And as soon as you access it, that empathy just floods out. You know, that can be very caring, I would say. And you had a question, sorry. Yeah, I guess I'm coming from um, my colleague, like, a speech pathologist. And I've been working with him for a while, and I've been working with children with um, autism. And with him, your life would have been much different if instead of being quirky and just um, very clever, do you think it, what we're doing with the children now, and they don't want to play with the other children in the playground. Obviously, they're not comfortable with that situation. Yes. But we see it's our job to still get them to work together and communicate with the other kids. So, yes. trying to explain that to them from a child's point of view. Yes. Do you think it would have changed your life very much? Or? Okay, so I'm going to go back to a specific memory in 1984 where I was at. Kering guy or Keringal, Keringal Primary School in Greenacre, yes? Preschool. Preschool, yes, preschool, sorry, that's the one. And I specifically remember um, that the other kids were on the fort when I was at the back near the barred fence looking out towards the pool. And had they, had they said to me that you're clever and you don't get what they're doing um, because they think differently to you, but the benefit of speaking to them is not to become one of them, but to learn to understand them um, so that if you need something in the future and they have it, you can get it from them. And that sounds quite transactional, but in my mind, that would make more sense when I think back. I would never have thought I need to become like them because I would always get pushed to play with them. And that was sort of... No, I despise that because that's sort of like saying, um, you know, imagine if... if I don't want to insult people. I was about to use humans and monkeys, but um, <laughs> which is a terrible analogy. Um, it's sort of like saying you're not good enough as who you are. Change yourself. You know, it's almost like I guess the analogy, a very bad analogy on top of my head, would be if, if you're heterosexual and you're saying no, 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 those guys are gay. You have to be gay like them or something like that. Whereas, whereas to say no, 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 that's different and that's fine. Um, you're not like that. They are, but you don't have to become exactly like them but you can learn that they are human just like you and you might have something else in common, something like that. You can see some of these children are already suffering depression because it's yes. not a happy place in the playground. Correct. Um, they would much rather be maybe in the library on the computer and um, developing no social skills whatsoever. Correct, yes. And of course, you know, yes. you need to encourage that. You yes. can see it's a brick wall sometimes. It's Correct. It's breaking our heart because we don't want them to have to be like their mind are. Yeah. To not be yes, yeah, like when I was in 1986, Miss Cara, when I was at kindergarten, would let me stay indoors at lunch and rebuild the model of the six blocks between my home and the school. And that was that was the, one of the best memories I have of primary school. Um, do I wish I was friends with the other guys? No, no chance. Um, yeah, um, it'd be good, hypothetically, if there was a class to say, this is how someone on the spectrum enjoys their social time, and this is how they enjoy their time, something like that. And, and, and I guess in my case, for example, at 25, when they explained to me why you have to say, how are you? That's when they taught me that what you're doing is conveying an emotional connection via words, but the words themselves are not the meaning inherently. So it's like a train carrying passengers. Um, I don't know if this is helping or not, but... Yeah, like the link, making a link. <laughs> yes, yeah, trying to explain the link. So that, to explain to them, yes, like how are you actually means I am emotionally connecting with you, so in the future if I need something, I can just ask you. And something like neurotypicals, I don't know, that's such a condescending name, but you know, most of your friends will need to have a how are you first. Um, you don't need that, they do. They need to play these games, you don't. But if you don't play, yeah. But if you don't play, it actually gets worse. Mm. There has to be an explanation uh, involving them understanding that they're not going to enjoy that and they don't have to be like that. Um, or they can do it for 10 minutes. And if they do it for 10 minutes, then they can go in and code. 
<laughs> yes. So knowing what you know now, that you sort of learn things like Pascal, yes. social interactions, and you were 25, what would you do now to say book here? Would you try to socialise him learning the how I start earlier? What would you do? Yes, I thought about that very much. What I have realised is that there was a gigantic, chasmic disparity between my IQ and EQ. And so, I was, and still am, able to socialize with people way younger than me. Mm. And that's, that feels normal, in a way. Mm. Um, but intellectually, I was, as a five-year-old, talking with 15 and 20-year-olds, for example. So, in hindsight, if they were just like me, I would want to, with the permission of my wife, if I ever got married, um, <laughs> Uh, that's not an adverse environment. So, um, <laughs> 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 <Savant. Com>. um, <laughs> uh, What I would probably want to do is is homeschool them in some subjects, and then have them socialise in other subjects. Mm. Something like that. It, it would have to be like that, I think. Um, and I would have to explain to them, this is what most people do, you're not going to be like that, you are different, it's okay, these are your strengths, these are your weaknesses. And that's actually what my aunt is doing with my female cousin at the moment, and letting her know like a female cousin always has urges to, you know, grab the desk and, or grab the skirt or, you know, move the eraser this way or something like that. She says, that's okay. Um, yeah. Does that half answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, sorry. What's your journey been like in your understanding of your own emotions? Oh, all right. Well, one of my first YouTube videos three years ago was understanding enjoyment. And I couldn't understand what that meant. Uh, the first one I always knew was anger. Uh, and that was a rate of blood surging. Uh, and, and so I was able to describe it that way. Enjoyment only came about three, four years ago. And that was what I, under, what I now understand it as, is as filling yourself up with positive energy so that you can expend it on things that will take away that energy. And I couldn't understand what that related to, but I've come to learn that that relates to, um, for example, if I go out, if I play the piano for half an hour, um, all of a sudden it doesn't seem as bad to do some of my admin. And so I've defined that increased ability to complete something I don't like from something else as enjoyment. Um, and then it's the same thing, similar to fun. And then, uh, yeah, with, with happiness, um, I, whenever I land in, at Beirut Airport, um, there's this feeling in my chest that, that's always there when I'm in Australia. When I'm there, the weight lightens. And I learn to associate that with happiness. So it's sort of like your responses and equating them with what people call this emotion, this abstract term, if that makes sense. So, I don't know if I've answered your question, if I've understood your question. Yeah. Coming at it from somebody like looking at the faces of people, so many children see that they love Thomas. I've always thought it's because all those Thomas trains have got faces because they don't need to check out the number on the train, the name underneath, and I've worked with for 35 years and I'm still thinking, I don't know if that's good or not. Thomas, they can just see it. Yes. So, do you get that feel as well? Like, it must be such a hyper visual sort of capacity for these the little kids that can just do it. Ah, uh, yes. I've always said people on the spectrum, I think, according to how I see it in my research and how I feel it, is that they don't see the rose, they see the petals. And, and it, with facial expression, for example, like the brain doesn't know which data to differentiate between in terms of priority, and so they can get very overwhelmed. Um, one example, if I go to a restaurant when I use earplugs, because I can hear each individual conversation, and like you say, you see all the different data points. Um, there's actually a, which I didn't talk about, there's a, uh, my facial recognition chart. What, what that actually is, it's next to me playing tennis. <laughs> um, the, what that is, is it's a geometrized version of facial expressions. And the way that I've learned to recognize facial expressions 
is by looking at the ratio of eyebrows to eyes to mouth and you geometrize them so you see how far above the 180 degree axis they are and if they're in sync for, gen for, for genuineness and if the eyebrows are sort of don't move up with the mouth then it's a less genuine smile, that type of thing. So, so you, I'm actually seeing the individual points on the face as opposed to, and I actually did a, did a podcast on this, I had 200 something people live and then more people later, but the live people I asked them, how do you know that's happy? And not one person could say, they go, I just know. And I'm like, okay, and then I would explain how those ge geometric forms would take shape relative to each other, and that's, that's how they see the data, it, uh, if that puts you in their headspace. I'm not sure. Yeah. Getting back to um, having the eyebrows and the do you think a autistic person is quite happy to go through their entire life and, and not gain? No, my, my experience is that people with autism, is the fact what I've met are some of the loneliest people because they're actually desperate to make friends. And, and I'd say that desperation comes from being the fact that it was so difficult and that they didn't have probably as many as, say, you know, the, the regular person might grow up having whatever handful of friends and can make friends or lose friends, etc. Um, some of the autism will try extremely hard and not understand why the person would stop talking to them. So it was a lot of trial and error with, with myself and that desperation um, increased over time. Some people might give up and just retreat and become a recluse. Um, what I came to learn was once I was able to function in a group of people for more than 30 minutes, I realized I wasn't missing out that much. <laughs> so that was, that was a good feeling. Um, yeah, that actually helped. Uh, and yeah, and I realized that um, I could spend time doing mathematics. That was that was there my friends. And meeting other people who think in similar ways and having extremely intense uh, intellectual discussions. Yeah, that works too. But yeah, they definitely, they want to be friends, but if you try to push them into a group, they'll run off. So, as if they're more high functioning, they'll want people to approach them especially if they're older, because they'll develop resentment that they didn't have it from a young age, and so we'll want to be overcompensated with friends. And then it'll look like they're attention-seeking. Uh, and then they might not be able to tell the difference between positive and negative attention, and so we'll do anything. Uh, yeah, just sad. From the autistic point of view, you're saying you're like desperate for friends, and you find that then most of them are desperate for friends. But what kind of friend do they want? Yeah, yeah. Because it's a very different kind of friends. But that's that's a good one. Degrees of friends. So you know the autistic brain would say friends, no friends. But but like you said, there is the gradations. There's degrees. There's friends in certain environments. So I was very lucky. My ex fiance taught me that idea, which is that you can have friends for different things that you're interested in. And but in my brain, I was asking, okay, but how do I know? And how many times a year should I contact them? And if I call them twice, they don't call me. Should I call again? And if so, how long do I wait? So there's a lot of rules that you have to try and develop. Um, but you're right, what sort of friends, they won't even know until... I was told that at 26. I, before that, I had no idea. I just thought, oh, friends, it's like when everyone sits around me and listens to me talk about everything. <laughs> 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 yeah, you don't know. Yeah. So what hope do you have for autistic children if they're not these days? I, I find that the lack of understanding of how the autistic brain sees things or perceives things, the word perceive, um, makes it much more difficult. I would say that that is where the coaching needs to go as well. It's not just upon the autist to completely understand the neurotypical, it's very difficult. It's like, you know, you get thrown into Kenya and it's like, learn, I don't know what to speak in Kenya, Swahili, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, speak, speak Swahili, come on. You know, and, uh, but uh, maybe someone from Kenya also needs to learn a bit of English as well. Instead of just saying you can't speak Swahili, you're a heathen. You know? So I'm not blaming anyone from Kenya, I'm sorry. It's not. <laughs> um, and what else? Yeah, that's about it. So, yeah, like for example, um, there was one lady I, I met her son. She wanted me to meet her son who was 16 who had autism. And as soon as I, the door opened, it, I saw the two year old and I said, This guy guaranteed is on the spectrum. You need to take him to get checked. So it turns out he does have autism. And she asked him to get his shoes from upstairs with the white laces. So he brought down, um, he, he said there are no shoes with white laces because there were shoes with white laces, but they had a red sole. 
And she and he said to her, but mom, that's white laces and red soles. You didn't say that, you said just white laces. So, you know, she thought he was being naughty. You know, and I said, no, no, no. That's exactly what I would have done. Yeah. All right. Well, you're more than welcome to ask questions afterwards. Uh, I, if, if YouTube probably the funnest channel to join. I have an autism playlist and I have a speaking human playlist. The speaking human playlist is where I go through the whole book. Um, there's a summary, because the book is quite poetic, so on its first read, some people who aren't avid readers might find it hard to follow. So, or not as easy to follow. So I have a summary on YouTube that goes for 20 minutes of the whole story. Um, like when I was kidnapped by six guys, or, and then, no, by, no, it was like four guys, and then later on, um, they came back, there was eight of them, and then I took them down and reversed their car into my uncle's house. Lots of weird stories like that that can happen if you grow up on a diagnosis. Uh, autism, and uh, there is also individual series on YouTube, and I'm up to episode 10, and I'm, episode 10 is where the bullying got quite severe, and then within me developed an extremely violent monster um, who learned to counteract those bullies, uh, and he became quite dangerous actually, uh, and that was something I had to wrestle with until, almost literally wrestle with this monster until about 22, and then I, uh, yeah, flipped and became the opposite after that. Hello. Yes, so if you go to Gapsmack on YouTube, you just search Gapsmack, it'll, YouTube will say, did you mean Gobsmack? I'm like, no, I meant Gapsmack. <laughs> All right, so Gapsmack on YouTube, if you type in Gapsmack and Speaking Human, uh, you'll find my channel, you'll find some of the Speaking Human ones, and there's a playlist to speak Speaking Human. Um, yeah. And some playlists are not family friendly, so say everyone knows what the other ones are. So autism, speaking human, I've got all the languages and other stuff. I talk, there's hundreds of videos on autism, well, hundreds of hours, and people ask lots of questions. So hopefully some of them can answer your questions better than I did today. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Um, I've seen two dogs in my future. Um, two children, I remember, the family was very high functioning. The one boy was in six. And um, been bullied quite a lot. And in his class, the dead boy had diabetes, and the teacher had asked this child with diabetes to explain the class what about diabetes. And he asked his teacher if he could explain the class of diabetes because I don't know if that's the that aspect. And not only that, it's actually afterwards. So he is a teacher, and he did workshop together and spoke to his class about autism and, and, and the bullying ceased. Wow. So okay. That's was, awesome. That is so awesome. Yeah, well, okay. another young boy, I was yes. recently, um, had to give the children's story to do with public speaking, but he had a call us, he had to choose a topic of his choice, and his mum decided, why does he speak about autism? And it was wonderful that I think it was really crux with me, and then in front of his class, then he was chosen to do it in front of the school, and then I highly commended. Um, so he was talking, he was explaining, I saw a thing that you're, yes. that he was explaining that from a child's point of view, and his mother's felt about what this, wow. why I'm, I'm different, this is why I do this. Doesn't mean I'm silly, but <laughs> that, that was a wonderful, humorous yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. That really helped. Then we spoke to the parents, that was actually really big difference. Does he give coaching lessons on speeches? So. <laughs> 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 I wonder if you. That's, you know, for some children, they're getting the best Absolutely. shed the message or spread the message. I am um, more than happy to talk to anyone who's willing or interested in listening. If I can help them, great. It makes me feel of value and it makes it, uh, it sort of helps 
compensate for what I went through. Um, it provides meaning. Yeah. So. Another question I have about music is in music, Yes. Yeah. Well, I know one of my therapists does something called the Tomatoes method. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. So that, I found that, I had tried it once and I found that quite amazing. Um, but I was a lot older by the time, so that's something to look into. Our Tomatoes method, it's it's a method that, uh, it's an oral method developed by Dr. Tomatoes, I guess. And uh, um, it's, it's a method that controls, it regulates the, uh, you know, I'm doing a bad job of explaining, but it regulates uh, perception and uh, emotional stability via audio input. And it's a session that goes for an hour each time and they play different parts of music in different volumes, different sides of the, the brain, um, through different ears, etc. Yeah, and, and it helps sort of regulate their mood and then uh, they help try to get them to do that on their own, ongoing. Yeah. So at what age um, do you think an autistic person should be diagnosed, and why is it earlier or is it better? Yeah, I think I was born autistic, I would say. Um, my, mother's, my mother said I didn't stop crying for two years. Uh, and so, according to my current therapist, that means that the child's needs were never met. To, to, and, and, and of course, they can't be met if you don't know they have autism. So they need special, like, external stimuli could have been disturbing me as a kid or whatever. And so the, the, the child ends up developing um, a subconscious trauma that I didn't find until 30 years later. So the earlier, of course, the better, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't speak until the age of two, but because of the savantism, by the time I spoke, I was fluent in two languages. So I was very lucky with that. What, one thing that I told Wendy previously, which I forgot to tell everyone, was what I've done to function is generate a table in my head of every single rule for every, every situation. So you can't... If there's a new situation that I haven't been in and I cannot compare it to something close enough, then I will completely freeze. And it seems very odd for someone who can speak publicly and function quite normally, I'd say, to then completely not look like they know what they're doing. And, and that's, very, that, that's something that our courts don't yet recognize as to how can someone be so confident here and so incompetent somewhere else that they haven't been. One example was when I was five, uh, when I came home from I was six, sorry, 1987. And I, I had come home in May of 1987. I was at the dinner table with my uncle and his ex-wife. And she asked me what I learned in Lebanon. And I said, I'd learned how to wipe my backside. And she said, you don't say that at the dinner table. Now, what I had learned is that that means I can still say it at the breakfast table or, or the lunch table. So the breakfast table and the lunch table were not equated to me in the same class as the dinner table. Because in the brain, it's like, okay, there's a table and there's dinner. So which one does it relate to? Does it relate to all tables or all dinner? How about dinner if there's no table? How about if there's a table but we're not eating? And so at the breakfast table, I remember I said the next day to my mom, and she said, you don't say that at the breakfast table. That's what she told you last night. I said, no, 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 she said dinner table. Right? Oh, you're being a smart aleck, right, type of thing. When the thing. Now you can see in hindsight that's exactly some of you might know family members who do that, so that's exactly what's going on. They're not actually being, sorry, not actually being a smart addict at all. You have to be very specific with, with the rules. What special insights do you have, do you think, because you have the savant as well as the uh, master? What special insights? Yeah. Uh, I, I just find it very interesting hearing you speak. And I'd say, from my perspective, a lot of your memory and so forth, or the clarity of your memories, is perhaps associated with some of this above side. Uh, and so because of that, you've got a great, a great recall to be able to reflect on those learnings and insights. Yes. Um, I would say well, I'm high functioning autism. Yes. But I don't have the same memory of episodes as a child that I hear you say. Yes. I've got a certain mathematical, but certainly not that extreme mathematical, uh, but yeah. I understand you might have. Um, I'm just curious as to how you see these relationship, and you've also talked about the church, you've got a number of different, what we call diagnoses, uh, 
I'm just curious about what you learned from all of those. Yeah. <laughs> How you um, well, I learned it a lot from Periscope, from my beautiful people watching, that because they tell me things that they see, they, they, there are things they see me do that they say they've never seen anyone do. And if each person knows, let's just say, you know, six unique people and there's hundreds of people that have said that, it starts to make me think maybe then my experience is more unique than, say, what I thought it was. And so what I'm describing to you, I don't, I don't feel that it's more unique. So I don't know which things are unique and which aren't. So when I answer you, I, I don't know which one will be. But um, what I have learned is that when people don't remember things, it doesn't mean they're stupid. And it's as a younger person, I would sometimes think that, well, I think they were lying to me. Is in how can you not remember what you were doing 35 years ago? It wasn't that long ago, right? <laughs> you know. Um, or you know, for example, you know, when I when I when I would. People don't know the history of Europe after reading it once, for example. Or they, they, they don't remember dates, or they, they don't know how the English language came to be. Um, they don't know how it mutated the etymology, etymology of certain words, and how the difference between the alphabet and language, and cuneiform, and, and writing, and each culture that presented each one of those, and the number system, and how they permeated uh, uh, you know, the human society, and at what times, and how diseases moved. And, People don't seem to have that knowledge, and so they don't see these meta patterns that I that I see. So when people make decisions, I think it's absolutely stupid when it comes to you know certain political decisions that or people have an opinion on something that seems to me tremendously uninformed. Um, that's not to say that I don't fall in that category and domains of ignorance in, in my sphere as well. Uh, but that's something I sense directly. Um, like you know, how, you know, like how do you not know? Uh, that you know, November of this year, the 14th is on a Thursday, for example. How can you not know that? So, so that type of thing is, is weird. Um, uh, when people would constantly say, "Oh, wow, you learned that alphabet in 15 minutes. You're pretty smart," you know, um, that used to annoy me because I'm like, "You have no idea." Um, but at the same time, I would do things that they would think were stupid. And so I could not understand how I could be smart and stupid at the same time. And so, yeah, so that's probably the dichotomy between the processing car, between the memory of my brain, and it comes through the ears. So if I hear something, then I remember it, basically. Um, but through vision, not, not very much so. Um, like, you know, once there was someone who attacked us, and the police said, did you get the number plate? And I said, I did, and I handed him the physical number plate. So, yeah, I, because my brother said, get the license plate, so I ripped it off the car. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and then and then I remember the police thought that I was being an idiot or I was the bad guy or something, but I was doing what he asked me to do. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, yeah. The literal yeah. 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 The reflection in a literal way that exactly. it's not meant for a neurotypical, but that's how it's interpreted by yeah. the person who. I'm, exactly, exactly. Yes, I've come to learn that there's like an axis, a vertical and horizontal. The horizontal is the literal, the vertical is emotional. And every time someone says something, there's a component that's emotional, a component that's horizontal, uh, which is literal. And the, the, if, if they're on the same axis as me, then I know that they're probably on the spectrum. Um, and then, of course, there's someone, there's many people I know and love that are completely the other way, and they never say what they mean. I have no understanding of what they're saying. Ooh, how are you today, my son? <laughs> I don't, what does that mean? <laughs> Why is that different to how are you today? Oh, how are you today? And it's like the different emotions. Like, that means something else to that. I know it does, but I don't know. So, what do you mean? Oh, what? I can't ask you how you are. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you can. Ah, but you don't answer me. And that's how it goes. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. You know? <laughs> anyway, um, all right. Well, I, I will think. Right. Oh, yes. Um, just curious about. Um, Yes. The, the there are two there are two distinct forms that I've met, and I've only met say I think about fifty or so through Periscope in real life, including my cousin, my mum, and the lady I, I talked to, um, who's representing females with autism in Australia. Can't remember her name, but if you follow my Twitter account, you'll find her. Jeanette. Jeanette Perkis. Thank you so much, Jeanette Perkis. Uh, and there are there are those who 
even though they're biologically female, they're basically male in their phenotype. So they are, to me, I see them as, as male. Um, and they act as you would expect a generic male to act in, in most domains, like the way they dress, the way they walk. Um, and that's, that's to me, if someone like that had autism, I would completely get that. It's like a guy with autism. But then there's another category I've met of women who are very classically female, I guess, if you want to call it. I don't really know the terms, but you know, I mean, this is obviously a spectrum of how we all appear, and you know, the alpha men, beta men, whatever it is, and the same. And my cousin's one of those, very feminine, I guess. Okay, archetypically, I've met many men who are feminine too, so it's not it's not about bio biology there. But they would appear from the outside like a stereotype, what you would think a stereotypical female is, or something. I hope I haven't offended anybody. Um, and it's harder to pick with them because it's obvious when I see her with her group of friends that she's an outcast. I can see it immediately because what you notice is that everyone else has got the eye contact and they're doing this and she's standing there and she doesn't know what to do. But when she's with me, she, she actually knows more than me, I find, or more than my younger self naturally, intuitively about how to say, how are you? So she can say, how are you? Easy and she's nine or 10 where I never said, how are you, till I was 25. And someone like that, if you would detest them, they would look like they don't have autism. But in fact, compared to the women in the group, it's quite obvious they do um, have autism because they exhibit all the other traits. Like when I see her with the other women, I'm like, that's me. You know? So I want to know what else to look out for. Yeah. So we're talking about eye contact. Um, yes. Anything else that we should include or exclude? Yeah, very, very specific. In the way they speak, they tend to get the joke an instant less than everyone else because what they'll do is everyone will laugh and they'll go, ah, ha, 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 but they have no idea what's going on, right? <laughs> Most people should do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you, uh, the, the copy, she copies her sister in fashion. She doesn't ever do like go out of their delivery to do it on her own. Very specific with numbers uh, is, and it's it's all together. It's not just one on their own. They, they tend to be brilliant at mathematics uh, in comparison, maybe. Um, yeah, like I can, like for example, my mom. If you if, you, if anyone's met my mom, uh, she's hilarious. Uh, you know, <laughs> she's so funny when she doesn't mean to be. Um, but yeah, if you meet her, she's very polite. You know, uh, one day my ex fiance came over and she just looked at her. My ex fiance came with some food and goes. Don't bring fruit to my house again. And that was it. And then she went, oh, so how was your day? Like it just completely switched from, she was being very logical, and then she went back to, oh, lovely to see you, you know. So there's that, there's that dichotomy there, and um, yeah, her, it's, it's something, there's another hypothesis by another doctor, which is not, it's not yet complete, it's called EMB, or extreme male brain hypothesis, where specific parts of the brain can develop what we traditionally call male, quote unquote, um, uh, skills. So, you know, one of the, you know, like, like Vera Rubin of the 70s, one of the most famous and most brilliant scientists, men or women, that's ever existed, um, clearly on the on the spectrum from her from her type of skill set. Um, but if you meet, if you see her in a conversation, she intuitively develops skills to actually um, speak with people quite well. But yet. And I might have been fact checked on this, but I'm pretty sure that she, what you might have called a geek who kept to themselves more often because she didn't get along with the rest of the girls, you know, with their whatever cliche stuff was happening at the time. Yeah. All right. Are we tired yet? Are we as tired as me yet? Wow. Well, I want to say a huge thank you for putting up with this, and thank you for your beautiful questions. And you can always contact me at realspeakinghuman at gmail for anything. And uh, out of the two and a half thousand I've raised, there was three hundred dollars left, so I'm using it to donate thirty books to everyone here today. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you, and may you continue to share your experiences with others. Thank you.